Welcome to Sports Beat KC, the Kansas City Stars Daily Sports Podcast. It's Friday, November 20th, and I'm Blair Kirkhoff. Just before recording today, Missouri's football team boarded a chartered flight and headed toward South Carolina. Playing a scheduled game used to be a given in sports, but not in 2020. So the Tigers are set to play at South Carolina on Saturday, and beat writer Soichi Tirada joins us to talk about Mizzou's first game in three weeks. After a break, we switch sports and talk with Sean Goodwin about sporting Kansas City's playoff opener Sunday against San Jose. A reason to feel optimistic about sporting's chances is the play of goalkeeper Tim Melia. Sean tells us what's made Melia one of the league's best at his position. So let's get started with Soichi Tirada talking Mizzou. Hello, Soichi. How are you doing today? I'm good, Blair. Never have I ever been so relieved to see a football team fly out to their next game. Usually that's kind of a guarantee or, or kind of something that we took for granted. But this week, Blair, I, I see some people posting on Twitter that they are headed to Columbia East. And I, uh, I, think, I think Mizzou fans should be very happy about that. I've seen the photograph on Twitter of the um, Sun Country Airlines, the charter <laughs> airline that uh, with the um, you know with, with the stairs out on the tarmac. So stairs to the airplane. Uh, I'm assuming coaches and players are, are on and uh, ha- have boarded and are winging their way to the other Columbia to play Saturday's game. And listen, it's. You know, we, we it's been well documented. There's it's no secret. Games have um, we have to wait until sometimes this wait this this uh, long into the week to, to determine whether teams are going to play. And that, there was another game I can't remember which one it was that I saw that that was called off today. So that brings the total to I know at least 16 college football games aren't being played this weekend. After 15 weren't played last weekend, there are no guarantees in college football. And it would have been really difficult for Missouri not to have reached the threshold of uh, a minimum number of players just because it has been a while since we've seen the Tigers play. Yeah, Blair, it's, uh, you mentioned that all the canceled games, the the SEC actually only had one postponed game. It was Mississippi and Texas A&M and that was squared away pretty early, which was nice. So yeah. And you mentioned the SEC roster thresholds. I was actually told that at least on the Mizzou side, I can't speak for South Carolina, but but they always kind of felt pretty optimistic going forward about this game. Obviously, last week for the Georgia game, they actually went down on a positional. They went below the position, positional threshold at defensive line, which caused a postponement. But it, it sounds like even if Mizzou had fallen below the 53-player SEC threshold this week, the game was likely still going to go on. And I think, um, and, and you mentioned this, Blair. I mean, Mizzou hasn't played a football game in, in all of November. You know, we're recording this on Friday, November 20th, and I believe it's posted today. So that that's a long time to go without a football game, you know, especially midseason. So I think Mizzou and perhaps even South Carolina post-firing a Will Muschamp, or they were both pretty motivated to get this game, and regardless of maybe even if they had fallen below that the 53-player roster threshold. Right. Okay, well let's let's do something unusual and talk about a football game that's going to be played <laughs> on, on on Saturday. Um, I, I am uh, I'm really interested to see how the Tigers respond. I, I know that when they played Florida in their last game, it was the Gators that hadn't played in a while, and you kind of wondered how Florida would respond to the Tigers, who had been playing. Uh, I think Florida had a there. That was a three week leg. Uh, you know, it, it had been three weeks since they had played when they met uh, Missouri, and, um, and 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 Florida looked the part in the first half. Didn't didn't play particularly well. It was um, it was close at halftime. Of course, it was the fight at halftime. That's what everybody remembers about that game. But then Florida found its uh, stride in the second half and ran away. What do you what do you expect from a Missouri team? That hasn't played in a while at um, you know at South Carolina. Will is the, is there a, a good possibility of coming out a little bit out of sync and um, just not hitting on all cylinders early? Yeah, I think that's always a concern, Blair. And and the thing that kind of strikes me, and I wrote about this, is it's 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 kind of a weird fine line in, in the sense that you really want to stay sharp during practices, but at the same time, when you're so close to losing players. An injury or two, you know, can wipe out just slim margin. So I think you're. I really do think you're going to see Russ kind of like you mentioned with Florida, at least in the first half. I don't know 
how much that would matter just because the South Carolina defense is just absolutely decimated in, in terms of opt-outs and injuries and transfers and all these different things. And they, they lost, you know, their two starting quarterbacks and I believe a safety and you were already giving up droves and droves of points in the past three games, which is why Will Muschamp got fired. So I, I think you'd be a little more concerned if you were playing maybe a Florida or a Georgia after a long layoff. But I think with with a reeling South Carolina team under interim coach Mike Bobo, I, I really think that's kind of a fortunate draw from Mizzou. Yeah, it, it's just been a, a, a crazy season for South Carolina after giving up uh, – uh, losing their first two to Tennessee and Florida. Not unexpected. They beat Vanderbilt – and uh, and and then have a great win, really, over Auburn, a team that I've got in my top 25. I think Auburn's a pretty good team this year. But then they give up 52 to LSU, 48 to Texas A&M, and 59 to Ole Miss. So it's just been sort of one uh, you know, d- defensive disaster after another for, for the Gamecocks. And as you said, Suichi, it got their head coach, Will Muschamp, fired. Interim coach Mike Bobo, I remember him at Colorado State having a few bowl seasons uh, at at Colorado State before um, things went uh, the the wrong way for him there. You know, who knows how South Carolina is going to react to a a new coach, an interim coach, sometimes that that, uh, for at least a game, maybe two, it sparks a team. But I don't know if I get a sense in this case that a new coach is going to inspire a South Carolina team that's just, you know, really uh, in, in in the doldrums right now. How, how do you – the Tigers are, what, a six, six-and-a-half-point favorite in this game, and I wouldn't be surprised if it ended up more than that. Yeah, uh, it's, it's funny, Blair. I'm glad you mentioned they kind of lost in this week was that Mizzou is a favorite, a betting favorite for the first time all season. They were underdogs in five straight games. I guess six if you count the unplayed – the postponed Georgia game, excuse me um, – yeah, I, that, that's kind of the sense I get, Blair. And I think in any other season, maybe you could look at it as a positive and think, hey, maybe the players will be a little bit more motivated to, you know, get their interim coach a win and, and everything like that. But I, I really think a few things are kind of going against that notion. I mean, you only have three games left if you're the Gamecocks in a 2020 season. And one, you're reeling, you're on a three-game losing streak, your coach just got fired. There's only three games, but then you throw the whole COVID-19 pandemic on top of it. And then... I, I really think – I don't know how much this plays into it, but as you mentioned, Blair, like Mike Bobo was at Colorado State recently. And, and I, I, you know, maybe if it was an assistant coach who had been around the program as long as Muschamp, maybe things – you know, you maybe the players could kind of look at that and be like, hey, this is – he's been our guy and he's been there every step of the way. But that hasn't been quite the case. So that's, that's kind of another weird thing. And then – so I, I think just between all of those factors and, and you just feel a little bit – you know, kind of disheartened just with all of the opt-outs. I mean, you lose your best player, arguably your best player, potentially a first-round NFL draft pick and J.C. Horn at cornerback. And then you lose other guys in that secondary that was just giving up so many points. And you wonder how much of that is on the players, how much of that is on scheme. But when you lose pieces like that, and, and we've seen Connor Bazelak has been able to sling this ball against, you know, kind of a bad secondary in that LSU game. So I think, I think if you're Mizzou, one – you know, you, you try to get back that rhythm that we've mentioned, but you also try to kind of exploit maybe a secondary that's, that's starting with a starting and playing a bunch of unproven players and, and maybe you can pad a little bit more stats and feel a little bit good about yourself just because Mizzou hasn't had a blowout win this season, just, you know, against Kentucky and LSU, great wins, but maybe they can feel a little bit better uh, coming out of this game and, and for the rest of the season because it does ease up considerably. Yeah, it's the first of four games left on on Missouri's original schedule. Am I right about that? Am, am I counting? Have I, have I got the, the right number, right amount of fingers on, on my hand here? Uh, um, after South Carolina, it is um, uh, is it Ar- It's Arkansas next week, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And then Miss- Arkansas. Yep. That and then be- Mississippi, right? And then Mississippi State, mm-hmm. and. And then, uh, and then, is it Vanderbilt? And are they going to make up the Georgia game? Yeah. So the SEC actually announced last Friday, kind of a news dump, but kind of maybe it overshadowed or, or, or whatever. But SEC actually announced that they had accepted that December nineteenth, which is the same day as the SEC championship game, can be used as an alternate date. And so I think the reason they haven't quite moved the Mizzou Georgia game is, is the fact that the Bulldogs. So technically, I, I doubt I doubt it'll happen because they lost to Florida, but. They're still technically kind of in the SEC East race. So 
should Florida drop a couple more games the rest of the season, I think you might see some shuffling near the end of the year. But as of now, I think all sides point to Mizzou, Georgia on December 19th. Okay, very good. Hey, and let's say uh, you, you had a story in, in today's paper and you and pulled out a stat that I did not realize involving uh, Larry Roundtree the III. Um, when he rushes for 100 yards or more, good things tend to happen. For, for the Tigers. That is, they're 2-0 and when that happens, and they haven't won when it doesn't happen. So we talked about Connor Bazelak and his his ability, but I I, I I agree with what you wrote, Suichi, that you get Larry Roundtree established. That's also a very good thing for Missouri. Yeah, I mean, it's so simple, and, and you know, I, I kind of struggled whether using it or not just because it is a very small sample size of five games. But in asking Eli about it, I think he made a great point in, in terms of just it being about game script just because when I, I re- during this very extended long break, I rewatched all five games Mizzou has played. And it, it really does seem like when they get behind by too much, which, which happened in those losses, that they kind of just abandon the run game. You don't really see Larry around you featured as much. And I, I really think that's a shame just because – even going into the season, you you really thought your running back situation between Roundy, Roundtree and Tyler Beatty, you, you really thought that was a strength of your team. So anytime you go away from that, I, I think you you kind of take away so, something that's pretty vital to that offense. And, and I really think, you know, I mean, Larry Roundtree's story has been told very well on the recruited, you know, coming out of North Carolina and everything. And and the thing that he kind of brings is just that you know he's going to take every touch seriously. He's going to run, you know, as hard as he can on, on however many carries he has, which was, I believe, 37 against Kentucky. So I, I just think he's such a big part of this offense. And when you look at the stats, it, it's simple, yes, but I think it kind of dictates other things. Uh, you, you look at it and you, and you kind of look at Larry Roundtree and hope that he kind of gets the uh, – maybe the the credit or or fans will remember him uh very well just because of uh of his time in Mizzou and everything. Well, and he has a chance to make some history too on Saturday with uh with just a couple of carries, few carries he he will he'll become the um uh he'll go to the top of the list of career rushing yards by a Missouri running back. Not not in Missouri history, but by a Missouri running back, right? Uh, so I think Zach Abrams got is is at the top of that list. Yes, yes, yes. So unfortunately for uh, Roundtree, and I actually thought about this: if he stayed another year with the blanket eligibility, he could have made it. But he he accepted a senior bowl invite, so that probably won't happen. But it, it's it's a little bit rough just because uh, you you look at you look at the stats and, and you see Brad Smith um, and, and and what he's done and everything and and, and you look at the stats and you're, you're kind of like okay maybe maybe that's a little bit too far for this season. Um, so Brad Smith is at 4,289. Roundtree is 19 yards away from passing Zach Abram, who's at 3,198, 3, so still over 1,000 yards there. But, yeah, I mean, being the most prolific running back in, in Mizzou history, I, I, I think still goes a long way just because you got guys like Zach Abram and Brock Olivo is obviously a legend, and all those backs that you've seen in Mizzou history, uh, very talented backs. And the fact that Larry Roundtree has a chance to, to, to kind of stand on top of all of that is a uh, – I think it's a testament to him and his longevity and, and this way he means it his team as a senior captain. And whenever the media speaks to him, I mean, I, I, I personally love speaking to Larry Roundtree just because he gives thoughtful answers, answers you know. Um, maybe sometimes after a loss, it's it's a little bit more mum. But every other time, man, he, he, he he's very thoughtful and you can tell he, he you know, just considers the question and, and thinks about the question. I, I, I don't think that's a guarantee with college students sometimes. So I appreciate Larry's uh, thoughtfulness and eloquence and everything. Yeah, I agree. I, I've been impressed with him on the on these Zoom uh, calls and uh, after games and and uh, when other, when, whenever else he's made available to the media. So, okay, game is at six thirty Central Time on Saturday at Columbia, South Carolina. The game is on the the SEC Network Alternative. So, um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm I'm getting a little tired of that. That Missouri gets to banned to the to the. Um, banished to the alternative network but uh but so it is uh if you can get it on espn3 too if uh if, if you're having trouble getting it on the uh on the alternate so all right suiji Torada, great catching up with you and we'll talk to you again next week all right thanks blair hey it's blair we have a special subscription offer for sports beat kc listeners unlimited digital access to the kansas city stars award-winning sports coverage Sign up now for one year of Sports Pass for access to all the sports news, features, and columns 
presented on the KansasCity.com site, and it's only $30. That's a 40% savings off our regular rate. Your subscription will automatically renew after the initial term at $50 unless you tell us to cancel. Your subscription helps support the sports coverage of KansasCity.com and the Kansas City Star, and that support has never been more important. Please visit KansasCity.com slash offer to get this special offer. And as always, thanks for listening. Sean Goodwin covers Sporting Kansas City for the Star, and it is playoff time. Sean, how are you doing today? I'm a good player. As you say, it's playoff time. I'm excited. It's also playoff time for high school football, which I also do. So it's, a, it's, it's an exciting time of the year for me right now. Yeah, yeah. Look, and and we don't take sports for granted in 2020, yeah. right? I mean, it's um, we we went months without anything, and um, and and soccer really kind of paved the way for sports to return. Yeah. In in the on the globe, and um, and now we're getting uh, the 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 postseason for for MLS. Sporting Kansas City takes on the San Jose Earthquakes on Sunday at Children's Mercy Park. Just a just a general thought, Sean, on is sporting in as good a position, um, you know, mentally, emotionally, every way you can be to, to begin a playoff run? Yeah, I mean, you know, you've obviously had a couple of weeks off now to help assist with their health and whatnot. So uh, health and tactics-wise, especially preparing for San Jose team, which is a little, a little different to what, you know, most of the teams in the league play, so it's good to have extra time to prepare. Um, Player-wise, I mean, you're missing Gutierrez and Zussi per usual. Apparently, Beasler isn't available this weekend, but, I mean, we didn't expect him to start anyway. Uh, so aside from that, I know Polizzo was still game day decision, but, you know, heading into the playoffs, sporting are, honestly, nearly as good as you wish they could be for you know, what you've dealt with this season. And and in a, a, something of an unusual twist, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but Sporting and San Jose will be meeting each other for the first time this year. Um, yeah. Usually in, in, in a playoff situation, it's a team that you've faced, especially if in the, you know, in, in the, in the, the conference, a team that you've faced multiple times during the season. These teams mm-hmm. have not met during the season. Yeah, I mean, ideally, you know, regular season, you play home and away versus your conference and then you're, you play your conference one time through. So, obviously, because of COVID and scares, we've played four games against Minnesota and four games against Colorado and Houston. So, um, it'll be, I think it'll be nice for all of us to just have a different team to watch. Um, honestly, a little bit something different for the coaches and players to prepare for, too. Hey, and Sean, so I, uh, Sporting won the, uh, you know, won their side, right? Uh, finished first in, in the, uh, in the West. Yeah. So I'm going on, you know, I get these, um, uh, these emails from uh, o- online be- betting uh, companies mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, I, I get them constantly about NFL and college football, NBA, Major League Baseball, but I saw some MLS uh, betting lines this week, and although Sporting finished, you know, with a terrific record, and again mm-hmm. first in the West, um, it, it the the odds of Sporting winning the MLS Cup are below about four or five others, uh, all from the East. I noticed, and and even in the West, uh, I think Seattle was was given a nod over a, a betting nod over Sporting Kansas City. Does mm-hmm. that seem right to you? You know. I, I, won't, I won't be completely against it. I mean, you know, I, I think you said you were probably six favorites or something despite finishing third in the supporters. Um, but obviously a big part of this as well is it's one and done. Um, you know, you win or you go home. And sporting has been pretty good the past, you know, four or five games defensively. But we do know that, unfortunately, this is a team where they can fall apart in the last five minutes, give up a stupid goal and... That could be that could be the end of the season. Um, so you mentioned that, and again, below in the Western Conference, you had Seattle and Portland both below Sporting in the standings. But they're both teams who they have the recent history of going deep in the playoffs and you know winning MLS Cups recently. And I know Sporting was only what seven years ago, but it's nearly a different team at this point. Uh, we haven't really, apart from the Western Conference Finals run in twenty eighteen. 
uh, we we haven't had a deep run for Sporting. So, you know, solid team. I definitely think they, of course, stand a chance. Uh, but when you look at some of your teams in play who have maybe a little bit more experience going deeper in the playoffs, you've got Sporting with such a young team. A lot of guys, it's going to be their first playoff run. It doesn't wholly surprise me, but uh, if I was a betting man, which I'm not because I'm 24 and poor, um, <laughs> uh, sports and Casey will be a good a, a good bet to hedge. I'll definitely put my money on them. Okay. Um, one of the reasons that, uh, that, that, that there would be to like Sporting Kansas City in a playoff situation is Tim Millia, the goalkeeper. Yes. And um, you, 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 he is—he's uh, really seems to be at the top of his game right now, which uh, which is saying plenty because he—he's uh, been a terrific uh, keeper for uh, for this franchise for for mm-hmm. quite a while. You wrote a really nice story about Tim Milia earlier in the week. I wanted to uh, take you back to that, and, mm-hmm. um, and what did you discover, uh, or or just uh, uh, what did you find most interesting about Tim Milia? Yeah, I think it's it's a facet that a lot of people don't think about because, you know, down the years, you, everyone knows Tim Mealy is tired of telling the story of how he was a, a poor goalkeeper to one of the best in MLS. Everyone knows that he's tired of saying it. Uh, but a lot of people do think that his story starts there when, you know, like many people just through life, I guess, it, it doesn't. He had... He had to get to that point to start. So one of his big things was sitting behind, you know, goalkeepers during his time at Chivas with Kennedy and Nick Salt Lake with Nick Romando. And, you know, these are some some of MLS's best goalkeepers in the last, you know, 10 or 20 years, really. Um, so, yeah, we, we talked a lot about, you know, it's a double-edged sword in that, yes, he was stuck behind these great goalkeepers. He wasn't being given an opportunity to play. But at the same time, he could study these guys at the top of the profession and how they play and, you know, what makes them a good goalkeeper. And obviously, every goalkeeper has their own style, which Tim Melia has built himself, uh, whether it's, you know, playing off the back, playing with his feet. But then he was saying, like, with Romando, he he learned to... He looks like he's just standing upright, but he's always on edge, always ready. That's a big part of his game, so... It was just super interesting to talk about a facet of his life and his career that people don't really concentrate on, which was his life before the spotlight and the plaudits, I suppose. You know, um, he he is exceptional in in many ways, but where he stands out in in a in an incredible way is on penalty kicks. Yeah, and the, there was the game against. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Chicago earlier this season at. Um, I can't remember if it was a home or away because yeah, every yeah. game, every, every game's on TV, right? That's how we consume them. Yeah. Uh, but he 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 has a big mistake in the first thirty seconds of of that game, and just you t- take us through what happened and how he responded to what happened. Yeah, so literally the first thirty seconds, it's against Chicago, who's obviously you know, because they're off the top of the league. It's a good chance for home for Sporting to pick up points, and literally. Within 30 seconds, the ball comes back to Melia and he just boxes the clearance right away, sends a straight into the feet of a Chicago player. Um, and, you know, they run into the box and in his haste to try and, you know, recover from his mistake, he instead takes down the player, gives away a penalty um, within the first 30 seconds. And before I say what happened next, one of the things that he was telling me about was he's always had this mentality through his career, as cliche as it sounds, and it's good for all goalkeepers. It's not what you've done, it's what you do next. It's, you know, focusing on how you can change the game next. Don't dwell on the past almost. So, you know, he he basically said he wasn't going to dwell on giving away the penalty. Um, and he goes ahead, he saves the penalty. It wasn't the best penalty, but nonetheless, he saves it. And then Sporting KC go on to win 1-0, which obviously, with a save, it's huge. Um, and that, you know, down the line has helped Sporting now with a one seed. So, you know, it, it, it does speak a lot to his mentality uh, that he's able to make not one, but two mistakes back to back and then still dig himself out of it and help SKC win. Absolutely. And he just uh, laid us in a line of terrific goalkeepers for this franchise, starting with Tony Miola and then uh, Jimmy Nielsen and now 
and, and now Tim Melia. So, okay, um, Sean, it's, it's Sunday. It is 3 p.m. at Children's Mercy Park against the San Jose Earthquakes on Fox Sports 1. Mm-hmm. Good day for uh, sports fans in Kansas City. They'll get to see uh, sporting at, at 3 and then the Chiefs at 7.20 that night on Sunday Night Football. So, uh, looking forward to your coverage of the game, and hopefully it's just the first first of many playoff games for Sporting Kansas City this fall. So, Sean, great catching up with you, and we will do we will talk again soon. Always. Appreciate it, Blair. Thank you. That'll do it for today and this week on Sports Beat KC. Thanks to our production staff of Derek Donovan, Randy Mason, Beth Welsh, Jeff Rosen, Chris Fickett, and Savannah Smith. A tip of the cap to Soichi Tirada and Sean Goodwin for stopping by and talking Mizzou and sport in Kansas City. Links to their stories can be found in the show notes and on KansasCity.com. Hey, we have another deal for you, especially for those who want a deeper dive into the Stars' terrific Chiefs coverage. For a limited time, you can subscribe to Sports Pass for 99 cents a month. That's right, 99 pennies a month. After three months, it auto-renews at $5.99 a month unless you cancel. How do you get it? You go to kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. That's kansascity.com slash sportspass2020. Do you want more than just sports coverage? Of course you do. I know I do. Check out the entire Kansas City Star product. Sports, news, features, commentary, analysis, the whole thing. You get all the stories written by my talented colleagues, plus additional news, sports, and business coverage that comes with the E-Edition. The details for all of these deals can be found at account.kansascity.com slash subscribe, and that's a lot of dots and dashes. So if you're having trouble hunting down any of these offers, send me an email, bkirkoff at kcstar.com, and I will get you to the right place. Whether it's the Sports Pass or the full subscription, you're getting and supporting the best sports and news coverage in Kansas City and helping us produce programs like Sports BKC. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back on Monday to break down the Chiefs-Raiders game. Thanks for listening.